Hey guys, it's Jacob from Living Healthy Every Day, and today we've got a cool podcast for you. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about nootropics, anti-aging, wound healing, uh, neuropeptides, growth hormone releasing hormones, and uh, a little bit about SARMs. And I've got Ryan Smith here with me. Thanks for being here, Ryan. Yeah, thanks for having me. He's a biochemist, uh, studied in, with peptides. He's the vice president of TaylorMade Compounding, and uh, they make all their other compounds in-house, or most of their compounds in-house. Uh, and we're going to be talking a little bit about sourcing after. So uh, thanks again. So let's let's get started. Let's talk a little bit about uh, cerebrolysin uh, and about like how that was found. What, what where did it come from? The history of it's relatively, uh, I mean, beyond me, honestly. We've been using it for over seven or eight years now. Um, and one of basically, it's a you know a combination of of nerve and brain growth factors. Yeah. Uh, you know, help promote survival of neurons and things like that. So it's especially good in chronic diseases. Uh, tourists have been studying Alzheimer's, you know, it's been, parts of it have been studied in Parkinson's as well. So um, originally it was, um, I guess, the, just a uh, drive from porcine brain material. So just uh, essentially, you know, they ground it up and put it in ALC <laughs> and uh, purified some of the components. It's a little bit, I guess, more uh, precise than yeah. that. But, Could you get uh, prions from that? Yeah, so that's the concern, right? So that's the reason everyone's transitioned. Um, you know, everyone's scared of you know mad cow disease, yeah, um, or things like that. So we, it's now transitioned to a synthetic component, um, sort of isolating the different parts of it. So I mean, obviously, you can talk. We can talk about the specific parts if you want. You sure. know, the silly. Yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, CNTF. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, yeah, so CNTF obviously um, has been studied in, in a host of things as well. But um, the data on cerebrolysin is, is really interesting because for me, it's especially interesting to me because I have an APOE4 variant, which predisposes me to oh, Alzheimer's. Yep, me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. So you can, uh, there's one really good study in the mouse study about uh, ameliorating deficits with APOE4 mice, which is really, really interesting. So uh, improving cognitive function as well as reducing beta amyloid plaques. Yeah. So, um, a lot of cool stuff, but unfortunately, the uh, precise mechanisms are a little bit, I guess, uh, still eluding scientists because it's not one particular peptide, but many. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's so cerebrolysin is uh, good for Alzheimer's. Uh, what about what what other diseases are there? Is yeah, so we have a, a variety. So we sell this as a pharmacy to doctors around the country. We have mm -hmm. some people using it in Parkinson's. Um, we have a lot of people that are using it just uh, for increased cognitive function. I would say the majority of the patients that are using it from us, that's what they're using it for. So back back to Parkinson's, what is it doing specifically? Yeah, so it's uh, essentially they think that it's promoting survival of dopaminergic neurons. Mm -hmm. um, so not necessarily improving the, I guess, Parkinson's um, once you have it, but helping prevent it from happening. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And then it's a, a nootropic, like we said. Some people are taking it to enhance their fu uh, cognitive function. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so, yeah, we formulated it as sort of a, a, a pill that's absorbed in your intestine. So it's enteric coated. Um, and that's the way that most people are taking it. Otherwise. Oh, so you don't um, have to inject it. Well, yeah, unfortunately, because most of the studies have been done as intramuscular injections with, yeah. uh, with a large volume. So it's usually up to one ml. And it's done every day, and you know, intramuscular injections every day becomes very, very difficult. So uh, finding another way to sort of dose that is, is pretty important. Otherwise, you have zero patient compliance. So why is it enteric coated? Well, it's enteric coated basically to preserve it from the stomach acid. Um, you know, with a lot of these peptides, whenever they hit the stomach acid, they will uh, hydrolyze and, and dissolve essentially. Yeah. So, um, so it's not that the, stable. Exactly. And stomach acid. <laughs> yeah, so whenever, basically what happens is when this hits a, the enteric coated, whenever it hits a acidic environment, it sort of strengthens the capsule. And then uh, in the more basic environment in the intestines, it sort of breaks down and releases the, uh, the, the peptides for, uh, for absorption. Oh, cool. So, you could, so uh, would taking bile with it help it, its absorption? Uh, yeah, like no. Ox bile uh, or something? So yeah, so again, this is, the enteric coated capsule is made in a variety of ways. So it's sort of, uh, you know, functions in, in everyday thing. <laughs> so unless there's uh, a digestive problem, we, we would say, you know, don't even worry about it. Yeah. Let's talk about another nootropic that's also able to take orally uh, and injected, uh, BPC-157, uh, body yeah. protective compound. Yeah. Obviously, uh, you know, this one's getting sort of all the rage currently. Um, 
because it does a little bit of everything. A lot of people yeah. say, that, um, well, I guess the main indication and main research has not been for, for I guess, uh, nootropic effect or, or cognitive function. Mm. Um, it's been more so for healing functions. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons, mainly because it has uh, you know, a sequence of, that resembles bone morphogenic proteins, that resembles uh, you know, collagen. So you get a lot of synthesis of those types of things. But it also has been shown in a few studies, uh, not very many, to, uh, to help, I guess, with brain functioning and brain cell survival as well. Yeah. Yeah. It also uh, it promotes uh, angiogenesis and uh, prolif- proliferation of new stem cells is what I saw in a, a mouse study. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. So it, again, it's it's uh, it's mechanism of action is pretty diverse because it does a lot of things. Works on the Paxlin pathway, um, you know, F actin. So it does a ton of things. But I did see that study. I actually hadn't seen um, the stem cell, but I, I, but I didn't know it helps with some brain function. Yeah, so it's uh, yeah. It, it's quite complex how it works because it it doesn't actually work on one mechanism. It's just working on a whole bunch of mechanisms and getting them all to essentially work together a lot of transcription factors it seems yeah. like a pretty revolutionary compound if uh it's not a panacea with <laughs> <laughs> yeah no absolutely so and uh again most of the studies have been done in croatia right um oh, yeah so, with microdosing uh, and things like yeah, that yeah, it's been shown to be effective up to like six micrograms per kilogram so um you know you can use very little um we do a lot of that mainly for tendon healing um we do a lot of injectables for tendons or ligaments, um, and then we do quite a bit for inflammatory bowel, Crohn's disease, um, you know, leaky gut, those types of things as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I've noticed that, or my pet rabbit's noticed that when he's tried BPC-157, uh, he feels a lot better. Uh, a lot of his food intolerances go down. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Just inflammation in general, I guess. Um, and yeah, we have a lot of people that will take it for a ligament issue and then sort of report as an ancillary benefit hey, you know, my digestion is, is so much better, my, my bowel symptoms are so much better. So uh, even people with gluten intolerance will sort of take it as a, uh, a way to mitigate some of their side effects. So it's healing the wounds inside the uh, intestines. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, originally, yeah, originally, I guess it was, you know, isolated from the, the gastric mucosa um, as for pre- protection from inflammation. So um, in terms of, in terms of uh, how it works with inflammatory bowel and things, I guess uh, it's mimicking that natural action. Yeah, I wonder if it has uh, anti-aging properties to it. Yeah, well, uh, I think a lot of people are using it as such because of its effect with collagen in particular. So it helps a lot with skin appearance. Um, there's even a, a mouse study that talks about CO2 lasers um, and the healing with you know diabetic lesions or CO2 lasers. So we have a lot of doctors, particularly people who functional, I guess, in uh, sort of med spas where they do a lot of re- facial resurfacing who love this compound because it reduces uh, the healing time of a lot of those procedures in half. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, another one that's really good for uh, looking... An- another one that's really good for looking good is uh, GHK, G- GHK Copper. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We, again, we do a lot of that um, for, I guess, all a ton of skin. There are, the, the amount of skin peptides there are, are uh, you know, extreme. They're... they're <laughs> hundreds and hundreds and they're pretty diverse. We actually use the GHK copper a lot in a uh, topical formulation because it's been shown to be more effective than minoxidil 5%. So um, it's better than any over-the-counter, I guess, hair product you can have. So uh, it increases hair growth, increases, you know, follicle size and number. Uh, so we do a lot of that as well. Mm-hmm. So what, what if you're like, uh, you have a receding hairline, would that help? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's, it's working on, just like minoxidil, on reducing, uh, I guess, the conversion of DHT via alpha reductase, so you get a lot less DHT, and uh, especially those who are, have a familiar history of uh, of baldness or, or male pattern baldness, this would definitely help. So is it localized? It is. So we, we do it as a foam. A lot of people will do it as a, a cream or something like that. The foam just really helps uh, to disperse it and use sort of, I guess, make get the most for your money. I guess. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, because I was wondering about uh, lowering DHT. You wouldn't want to do that everywhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if you're putting that on your scalp, but, yeah, uh, that's one of the problems I guess with you know taking finasteride, um, which a lot of people do in order to prevent that. Yeah. yeah. So another so, anti-aging is uh, you got a. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm saying this right. Epitalin. Yeah, uh, I mean, a lot, it, this is a Russian peptide, so people spell it and pronounce it yeah. a ton of ways. Kind of like uh, Emax. How's uh, yeah. 
some max or, or like <laughs> it's got a ks yeah. and yeah exactly yeah so uh yeah so pronouncing it is different we usually here spell it uh epitalon is what we usually say okay cool yeah and how, what's the mechanism there it's uh, that one is also very diverse in terms of anti-aging it is one of the uh I guess most encouraging peptides because it has a 15 year follow-up study. Um, so uh, it has, I guess, the main mechanism of action is working on the uh, pineal gland basically um, and regulating levels of cortisol and melatonin. So it essentially works on, I guess, regulating your circadian rhythms, having your cortisol peak when it's supposed to, having your melatonin peak when it's supposed to. So it helps with sleep, um, it helps with inflammation. Um, it do, does a bunch of diverse things. Uh, it's also been shown to activate telomerase um, in a somatic cell line. So they use lung fibroblasts, um, and it actually increased the telomere length by 33%. A very, very encouraging study. Um, and all of the data is usually done under one PhD in Russia, whose name is Kavinson. How is that uh, related to, uh, like, similar wise to astragalus and its ability to lengthen telomeres? Yeah, so Astragalus is one of the only other products on the market that has been significantly developed uh, to sort of show telomere length. I should say that the two products are pretty, uh, I guess there's a little bit of conflict between each. Um, Dr. Andrews, who is one of the, I guess, the telomere experts, um, especially in the medical community, he has, uh, I guess, some doubt in the, in the authenticity of this Russian literature. He thinks that a lot of the uh, the data looks a little bit um, too good to be true. Yeah, you so, need more. Uh, need a clinical trial on that. See how it works. Yeah, exactly. We're actually doing uh, partnering with LifeLink, which is generally, uh, I guess, people consider it the best test of telomeres as a test of shortest telomeres. We're actually doing a, a small clinical trial around 100 patients, um, testing oh, wow. you know, how well epitalon works and if you know, sort of adding validity to all those Russian studies. Oh, I'm excited for that. When's that yeah. start? Well, we're starting here recently. Uh, we've changed, like I said, one of the best things is that this product is a 15-year follow-up. Um, and the 15-year follow-up is amazing, reducing all the cardiovascular events, um, reducing mortality, doing a ton of things. Um, and that was only taken three weeks uh, for three years. So very, very minimal dosing. We're going to change that a little bit um, to sort of accelerate the time period. But uh, we should start here and be done within a year. How's it taken? Uh, with most of the peptides, we suggest taking them uh, sub-Q. Um, okay. That's just because, like we talked about earlier, you know, uh, if you try and take them orally or even nasally, you have a lot of uh, enzymes that cause degradation. Mm -hmm. So we always recommend being careful, but also it comes to a price consideration where you want to get, I guess, uh, the most bioavailability of as little milligrams as you can. Yeah. So sub-Q is always the recommendation. So you said epitalon. Uh, works on the circadian rhythm by regulating the pineal gland. Yes. That's so is correct. there is there a certain time that you want to take it so it enhances the circadian rhythm? Yeah, nothing in the literature has been uh, clearly demarcated, but anecdotally, I can say that most people will like taking it in the morning. Uh, most people say they get better results. They uh, you know sleep better at night if they take it in the morning. Ah, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's that's a pretty cool like anti aging peptide yeah. right there. It's amazing. It, uh, you know, it does a ton of things, um, and that, that's only the beginning. Like I said, the circadian rhythm stuff, but there's a ton of Russian literature, which I would recommend everyone going to read. Yeah, I just wish I knew Russian now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got them all translated. As oh, well. Okay, cool. I'll also take a look at the. I'll take a look at the the literature and see what else it can do. Sure. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about uh, growth hormone releasing hormones. Yeah. So, Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we got a uh, GHRP six. Um, let's just get into that. The yeah. So, that. Yeah. So um, I guess the I guess if you don't mind starting off, it's good to differentiate between the two receptors which um, which help secrete your growth hormone from the pituitary. So generally, you have your growth hormone releasing hormone receptors and your ghrelin receptors, mm -hmm. um, and each of them is sort of mediated by a, a different factor, right? So. You have uh, your ghrelin mimics, the strongest of which is the one you just talked about, the GHRP6. Mm -hmm. um, it, again, it, it's, it's been around for ages um, and sort of, I, I guess, derived from uh, ghrelin. Um, it's a little bit shorter, but also a little bit more, more potent, um, but it has some, some side effects that come along with it. All right, so let's, let's actually talk about ghrelin first. So sure. how does ghrelin work in the body? I, and we, we've got ghrelin and leptin. 
And uh, yeah. most people just know it as I need to eat and I need to stop eating. <laughs> well, that's pretty good, though. I mean, um, you know, yeah, obviously leptin gives, makes you, uh, I guess, stimulates your satiety and your uh, ghrelin obviously stimulates the intense hunger. So yeah. uh, it's not a bad way to look at it, but ghrelin is sort of secreted by, again, your, your gastric system. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you have different cells which essentially tell your pituitary, hey, secrete growth hormone or don't secrete growth hormone. But it's not just your pituitary, I think, as well. It's also important to know you have a lot of these receptors all over the body. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but uh, yeah. So, so again, that's not a bad way to look at it. But so, uh, so it, you've got gastric acid secretion is the first thing. You've got uh, increase in growth hormone. Mm-hmm. What else is it doing? Uh, well, again, it's doing a lot of things depending on where you look. Um, it, again, <laughs> uh, you know, if it it mediates a lot of intracellular effects as well. So it works on different cells, stimulating transcription of genes. Um, I guess. Uh, you can think of it as sort of an inverse hormone to an insulin type response. And that's, I guess that that's sort of how you would want to look at it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, we, there's an analog to it, uh, MK677, right? A bit more in? Yeah, correct. That's also, yeah, the, working on the ghrelin receptors. Um, unlike a lot of things we'll talk about with the growth hormone secretagogues, this is the only one that is orally bioavailable and it's actually not a peptide. Mm-hmm. So, you, yeah. you just take it orally and... Uh, yeah. I think the studies are uh, 25 uh, milligrams to 50 milligrams per day. Yeah, it, yeah. it seems to be, uh, yeah, 25 milligrams seems to be the dose. It seems as you get, um, as you increase dose, you get a sort of, not a dose dependent response, it sort of plateaus out. So yeah. 25 milligrams is generally where you want to stay. Um, and most of the literature has shown that with that particular product, um, while you get some increases in muscle mass, um, and some people have reported that, you know, improvements to their skin, and, improvements to energy, you don't necessarily lose fat mass. Mm-hmm. So, um, so again, it's mostly a lot of people who like it are trying to increase that muscle mass. Um, people who are trying to sort of lean out, um, typically get, go in different directions. Yeah. My rabbits tried it too, uh, <laughs> and was doing it while it was intermittent fasting, uh, yeah. and really didn't see any, uh, fat buildup at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's uh, that's interesting, but uh, yeah, well, this is the one we don't typically do a lot of, um, just because it's like regulatory concerns. So we work with a lot of rabbits as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So we talked a little bit of ghrelin. Let's get into growth hormone releasing hormones. Like, uh, sure. yeah. So uh, there are really three that have been uh, that have been around for a while. It's all started with Samorlin, which was in the you know the late '80s, already approved by the FDA, um, mm-hmm. and it's just sort of all around the country in a lot of uh, medical clinics. Um, you know, it, it it's okay, it works, um, but it's not nearly as good as some of these later generation peptides. So, um, mm-hmm. looking again at 29 amino acids, um, what they did is the second generation turned out to be the CJC 1295 or the MOD GRF 129 is a sort of more appropriate name for it. Um, because again, that one doesn't contain, uh, it contains a few more amino acid substitutions, um, but it's really has a much greater change in growth hormone secretion and IGF-1 secretion. So you get um, much higher levels um, and it stays on the pituitary, stimulates that response for a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. That and uh, I, should, I should note with all of these, um, usually taking them right before bed, um, most of these will to mimic natural growth hormone secretion. Some people will do multi-day dosing, um, depending on you know the time of day, um, whether they're doing a post-workout or fasting. Fasting is also very important because insulin will reduce the growth hormone response. Sort of like we talked about with uh, the ghrelin receptor, uh, it's important not to have insulin in your system when you're taking these things. Mm-hmm. So taking something like this, W- would it increase your IGF-1? And so it's doing something like fasting that increases your uh, receptor's ability to uh, pick up on these a little bit better for like insulin. Right. And so doing taking something like, uh, let's go back to ibutamorin, mm-hmm. taking something like that, that would enhance the receptor's availability to, or the, the peptide's ability of IGF-1 to attach to that receptor. Yeah, so well... I, the way to think about it is that uh, sort of how they interact with somatostatin, which again is going to block that growth hormone response. Mm-hmm. And so insulin will also help block that through somatostatin. So um, essentially you have them bind to the pituitary uh, and the receptor 
functioning on that is going to be mitigated by somatostatin. So if you have high levels of somatostatin, you're going to get less binding and less of a result. And all of that leads to a downstream pathway of less IGF-1 production. So would taking something like uh, huperzine A help with that? To be honest, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Because so. um, it's shown to uh, block somatostatin. Yeah, Same absolutely. thing with uh, melatonin. That's why your growth hormone is so high when you sleep. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that would make sense. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. Yeah, and then, lastly, the only growth hormone, uh, I guess, product we hadn't talked about was the Tessamoral, and that's another FDA-approved product for AIDS lipid dystrophy, but it's by far uh, the most powerful, sort of the closest pharmacological, um, I guess, drug to endogenous growth hormone-releasing hormone. Um, and that has been shown to, on average, increase IGF-1 by 181 points. Um, it reduces, you know, C-reactive protein levels, reduces carotid intima media size, reduces uh, triglycerides, reduces visceral adipose tissue. It does a ton of things, and it's extremely potent. Wow. And that, that's FDA approved? It is. It's FDA approved. It's, uh, again, you, most people are using it off-label. Um, it also retails for $5,000 a month to AIDS patients. So wow. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy so um but it works and it, it works really really well are you guys making that uh we are we're, we're compounding it uh less expensive price but uh you know it still gets pretty expensive and you get close to the growth hormone price so um so it still becomes difficult yeah so some people are trying to get large uh and they're taking selective androgen receptor modulators or SARMs sure um what are the benefits of those? Let's start with the uh, Osterine. Yeah, so, well, I guess with the SARMs as a class, um, there are a couple benefits that people typically point to. Uh, the two most important are that it doesn't convert to estrogen uh, via aromatase, and it doesn't convert to DHT via 5 alpha reductase. So uh, you don't get you know things like gynecomastia or a lot of the, uh, I guess, estrogen symptoms that you would get with, for instance, doing any anabolic steroid or doing regular testosterone. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing would be that without the DHT, you have, you're less likely to lose your hair, you're less likely to have uh, you know, prostate hyperplasia. So yeah. people are particularly worried about that. Maybe men who have a history of prostate cancer or familiar history um, can, can take that to lead to some of these uh, you know, increase in muscle mass um, symptoms uh, with some of the SARMs. So the Osterine is sort of one of the oldest SARMs, uh, mm -hmm. been, been around for a while. Um, and all of the SARMs, I should also say, are orally bioavailable, which is, again, a plus whenever you're comparing it to an injection. Um, so the Osterine is one that's been around for a while. Um, and again, it, it's uh, probably not the most potent, not the strongest, but uh, it definitely works to help increase muscle mass. It is a little bit um, less selective for anabolic tissue than a lot of the SARMs. So you see uh, not only an increase in anabolic tissue, but you also see the mental side effects that come along with those androgen receptors. So you see increased energy. Uh, some people report increased confidence and increased uh, libido as well. Mm -hmm. Is that more effective in guys than in women? Yeah. So uh, in women, there's been actually a direct study that talks about its libido effects in women. Um, but it definitely is a bit more effective in guys. Um, and it's also traditionally you've been using guys a little bit more often. So you're comparing a little bit different data sets there. But uh, but yeah, it's extremely effective. We actually do it as a transdermal cream. Um, and the okay. reason being is that this is for women, they can actually, one of the side effects we've seen as a transdermal cream is that um, it has a skin tightening effect. So a lot of women will use it on the back of their triceps or uh, their thighs or just areas they want to sort of tone up. So we do a lot of that. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. I haven't Absolutely. seen it in cream form before. Yeah, some of the studies have done, been done in cream form, um, and it, it's pretty effective. It's 98% absorption, which is uh, difficult to get wow. for just about anything, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, absolutely. So another SARM, you got LGD-33. Yeah, that, that, that one is far and away uh, one of the most exciting for me. Um, it's only been around a short time, but there's a really good study uh, that happened at Boston University that is uh, sort of the hallmark study. So they usually do it for about... This study actually did it for 21 days, so just three weeks. Um, and most of the, they did three different doses, but most of uh, the most encouraging research was sort of showed that it decreased body fat, increased muscle mass by around 2.1, 2.2 pounds. 
Wow. So, um, you know, very, very encouraging in a short amount of time. Yeah. The only issue is uh, SARMs are still not ready for prime time. And I tell everyone that you've got to be very, very careful about it because they all have some side effects. What are the side effects? What are the downsides so, of this? It sounds yeah, too good to be true. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, with, with any oral uh, androgen receptor modulator, you're going to uh, you have to worry about CAT metabolism, um, which can do some damage to your liver. And the other thing, particularly with LGD that you see, is you see a reduction of your LH and FSH. So it's going to cause suppression of your HPTA axis like you would with any any type of steroid. Um, the good news is that within two weeks um, of stopping it in that three-week trial, all the participants went back to normal. So it was recovered pretty quickly. The other thing they saw was um, some lipid changes. For instance, you see a decrease in HDL cholesterol um, and an increase in LDL. Mm -hmm. And did that reverse after? It did. That also reversed within two week follow up period. Wow, that's cool. I mean, these all sound like miracles. All these, everything we've <laughs> talked about. <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, you know, they come out with a new SARM just about every day. So I imagine, uh, you know, eventually SARMs will be the testosterone replacement of the future. But I think there's a ways to go for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Instead of uh, straight up hormone replacement, you can just take a SARM of some sort. Exactly. Yeah, and modulate that. Modulate um, yes. Yeah, the, the songs are doing great. Uh, and, you know, there's they're becoming more potent and stronger by by the day as well. So, uh, you know, some people are a little bit worrisome because they try and push the boundaries a little bit. But uh, I think that the ones in the literature, like the, the Austrian and the LGD, are, are generally where uh, the safety and efficacy is at at the moment. Do you source those uh, those two those two songs? Yeah, we do. We uh, I should say we do for now. I, I don't know that uh, we'll be doing it much longer. Um, we'll, we'll see about. It. <laughs> Yeah, let's actually talk about the importance of sourcing because there's so many websites out there that you're either buying a fake something or you're buying something toxic. Uh, and very rarely, not very rarely, because I, I don't know all of them, but you can get you can get hurt. You can be buying yeah. snake oil. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, I guess that's sort of where we've made our mark is we're sort of one of the only producers and suppliers of this within a medical setting. So we do uh, a lot of our own HPLC mass spec testing to make sure everything is what we say it is. Um, but even if you don't buy it from us, there are definitely websites where we recommend and what we wouldn't. Um, and so again, one of the services we offer is that, you know, you can uh, send anything to us and we'll test it and we'll show it to you. We've seen some really scary things in terms of uh, particularly anything that's not a peptide um, encourages the risk of contamination. So uh, your things like your SARMs, your things like your MK677 are the things that are a little bit higher risk, whereas your peptides, you're generally either going to get it, you're not going to get it, or you're going to get um, some potency, which is between you know 40 to 60 percent, which uh, obviously is not great, but I doubt it will hurt you. Yeah, I just worry about injecting some toxin into me. Uh, I know you have stomach acid to protect you from some things. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, and then, then that's the thing. So you got to make sure you know where you're getting it because uh, you know, there's no protection, uh, no hepatic first pass metabolism. It's gonna go uh, straight into your bloodstream, um, good or bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, everything you guys do, it's uh, by prescription, right? Correct. We require a prescription from a doctor, um, and yeah, and generally whatever indication that they see. Uh, and they monitor you, the, your usage, so that even if you come in with a lot of knowledge, you know, you sort of have a health practitioner to, to help you through. Cool. So I've got two more questions to you. Which would sure. you say is the best for gaining muscle? And then which is the best for longevity? I know longevity is more of a speculation one uh, because that's over a really long period of time. Yeah. But just like, so of, yeah. Starting with longevity, if the data can believe about the epitalon, it is absolutely the best product out there. Um, I mean, like I said, the uh, the mortality events, the cardiovascular events, everything has been decreased, as well as increasing telomerase, um, which it also has a sort of an anti-cancer benefit, which is encouraging. Mm -hmm. um, so that one, for sure, for longevity, if the data can be believed, hopefully we'll have a little bit, uh, I guess, more an idea about that um, in the coming months. Um, but then I guess for adding muscle, that one's difficult. The LGD, I think, is sort of hard to, uh, hard to compete against in its anabolic properties. Um, but like I said, the side effects make it um, probably less preferable than one of the growth hormones or cretagogues or uh, even just regular testosterone therapy. Mm -hmm. Which one is probably the safest growth hormone uh, secreting? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I, I recommend uh, the combination of the CJC-1295 which is again what I'm referring to as mod GRF 129. Mm -hmm. um, 
in addition to the ipamorlin. Um, and the ipamorlin is the best of those ghrelin mimics, um, just because it's the most selective. Um, it's definitely not the strongest, but whenever you can, bear, can combine the two, and there's a lot of good data on this, particularly there's a really good graph um, that talks about com using both of these things together, and they're very synergistic, so you get five to ten times increase in growth hormone and IGF-1 levels if you combine two of the products. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah, it it seems like there's a lot more factors when you're combining it, though. Yeah, it well, uh, out. and again, uh, this is some of the things. We, we don't recommend multi-day dosing. A lot of people will. Um, just because, again, you with a very short acting product like we're offering, which you know lasts anywhere from you know 28 minutes or less, um, you can you can sort of peak your growth hormone. But we recommend it just doing it once at night, yeah, maintaining right before bed, exactly, and uh, just keeping it as natural as possible. That's awesome. Well, yeah. thank you, Ryan. This was awesome, very informative. And uh, what's your website if people want to see more? Yeah, you can uh, find us at tailormadecompounding.com. Um, and if they need any information, they can always reach out to us on there. Okay, they can contact you on there? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys, for watching. This was a, a neuropeptide podcast. And if you like this video, click like. And if you want to see more like this, click subscribe. And you can hit that little bell if you want to get notified when the next video is up. So thanks, guys, for watching. And stay beautiful.